instructions. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all your answers in the listening question booklet. At the end of the real test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section 1. Section 1. In section 1, you will listen to an interview about the homestay program between a coordinator and three students. As you listen, fill in the missing information in the chart. If a student's experience in the first homestay is positive and very good, make two ticks. If it's OK, make one tick. If it's not good and there are negative feelings, make a cross. Look at the example and questions 1 to 8. Now you will hear the interview for section 1 and fill in the form as you listen because you will hear the recording once only. First, have another look at questions 1 to 8. Now you will hear the interview. Listen carefully and fill in the form. Hi, Fumi. Come in. How are things? OK. Hi, Linda and Ali. How are you? Fine, thanks. Well, as I explained on the telephone, I'm a coordinator of the homestay programme here at the Student Services section of the university and I'm doing a survey on host families to help me draw up a guide for new students. So I'd be grateful if you could tell me about your own experience on the homestay programme. Right. Good idea. Now, Fumi, let's start with you, OK? How long have you been staying with your host family? It's about three months now since I came from Japan. What do you like about your host family? Oh, they are very nice to me and give me freedom to do what I want. I feel quite safe there, just like at home. Do you like the food there? Yes, I love Canadian food. I always want to try new things. It sounds good. Is your experience a positive one for the homestay program? Yes, I think this homestay program is very good and it really provides an opportunity for cultural exchange between Canadians and international students. Thank you, Fumi. Uh, we'll come back to you in a minute. Linda, I'd like to ask you some questions. You have been here for about a year and a half, is that right? Actually, it's about two years since I left Beijing in 2003. What do you think about the program? The homestay program? The program itself is quite good, but it really depends on the individual host family. My first host family was quite a nice family, especially the first two weeks. They took me to the bank, shopping center, it did many things for me, but I had a problem later. What was the problem? My biggest problem was the food. It was awful. They provided me with sandwiches for breakfast and lunch, and they liked to eat raw vegetables and not fully cooked meat for supper. I was not used to their food, and sometimes I felt sick. I had stomach problems for quite a long time. I see. I'm sorry to hear that. So, after three months, I moved out, and now I live with two other students in a student house. Well, Linda, if the food was changed to what you like, would you stay in that family? Sure, I would. I see. What about you, Ali? You come from Japan? No, I come from Korea. I'm sorry. Ali, how long have you been in Canada? About eight months. Do you enjoy staying here? 
Yes, it's a nice place and a very good college. What do you think about the homestay program? I quite agree with Linda. The program is good. The host family is different, and if you're lucky, you may get a good one. But the first one I stayed with was really terrible. Ah,、oh, I'm sorry to hear that. But could you tell me a little more about it? Yes, my first host parents seemed very busy. They usually came back home at about ten in the evening, so I would be hungry until they came back. Did they leave some food for you、uh, when they came back late? No, never. They didn't. They didn't allow me to cook in the kitchen, which was a house rule. That's odd.、Uh, what about your room? Was it comfortable? No, it wasn't. I'd say it was awful. Their dogs often slept in my bed. I complained quite a bit about the dogs, but they weren't sorry that the dogs were in my room because my room used to be their dogs' room. I'm very sorry to hear that. Did you tell this to anyone in the office? Yes, I did. So I was moved out and changed to the host family where I stay now. Are you happy with the new host family now? Yes, I'm very happy now. They're nice and very considerate, and often help me with my homework. How about the food? It's good and often served on time. Good for you. Thank you very much. That's the end of section one. You will have thirty seconds to check your answers. Section two. In this section, you will hear a conversation between two students. As you listen to the conversation, fill in the gaps numbered nine to fifteen, and answer questions sixteen to twenty by writing a T if the information is true, an F if the information is false. And an N if the information is not given. First, look at questions nine to twenty. Now listen to the conversation and do questions nine to twenty. Hi, Marty. What did you think of the lecture? It was really good. I enjoyed it very much. By the way, how are you doing with your European Studies tutorial paper? Oh, good. I've just finished it actually. I need to do something different tonight. What are you doing tonight? Would you like to go out with me? Oh, I'm sorry, I can't. I have to work late tonight. What for? Well, I have to finish my paper and prepare my presentation for tomorrow. Ah, I see.、Uh, what's your presentation topic? Well, after some consideration, I decided to talk about Napoleon. Oh, that's an interesting topic. Napoleon is one of my favourite characters too.、Uh, have you got time for a cup of coffee? Can you tell me about it as a sort of practice? That would be great. Now tell me about Napoleon. I know he used to be a French soldier, and very quickly he became Emperor of France. Do you know when he was born? Yes, he was born in 1769 on the island of Corsica, and when he was only ten years old, his father sent him to a military school in France. Was he a brilliant student at school? No, he wasn't, but he excelled in mathematics and military science. And then, when he was sixteen years old, he joined the French army. Oh, I didn't know he joined the army that young. His military career brought him fame, power, and riches, but finally defeat. Napoleon became a general in the French army at the age of twenty-four. Several years later, he became emperor of the French Empire. Do you know when he became an emperor? 
Yes. On May the 18th, 1804, he became Emperor of France and the coronation ceremony was held at Notre Dame on the 2nd of December. He was only 35 that year. He was really many things, but he was, first of all, a brilliant military leader. His soldiers were ready to die for him. Yes, he was really short too. Of course, Napoleon had so many military victories, so his size wasn't an issue. You're right. At one time, he controlled most of Europe. Yes, but at that time, many countries, including England, Russia and Austria, fought fiercely against Napoleon. Right. His defeat came when he decided to attack Russia. In this military campaign in Russia, he lost most of his army. Shortly after his defeat, his abdication followed at Waterloo. And then he tried to escape to America, but he failed. He finally surrendered to the British government, and then they exiled him to St Helena Island. I know his last years were spent there with a few chosen comrades. Uh, do you know how old he was when he died? He lived there until he died. He died in 1821 when he was only 51 years old. He died alone, deserted by his family and his friends. Well, that's a pretty sad way to end one's life. Well, Marty, I'm sure your presentation will be really good. You know, you could also give the chronological order of his life, and this may help your classmates to follow your presentation. Yes, that's a good suggestion. Thank you, Tom. You're welcome. I have to go now. I have another lecture to attend. Good luck. Thank you. You've been really great help. I'm sorry that I can't come out with you this evening, but have a nice time. Bye. Bye. You will hear a university professor giving information about student assessments. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen and answer questions 21 to 25. OK, I'd like to take a moment now to talk about the assessment requirements for this semester. Firstly, as you can clearly see on your handout, there are four assessments this semester, an oral report, an essay and two exams. They are weighted 20% each for the oral report and the essay, and the remaining 60%, as you can see, is divided equally between the two exams. Yes, John? Yes, Dr Thomas. Regarding the oral report, can we present this with a partner, or must it be handled individually? In the past, oral reports have been researched and presented in small groups of two or three, but this year we've decided to try them singly and see how they go. We're certainly not locked into any one way. All we do ask is that you use PowerPoint for your presentations. The university has all the equipment you will need to deliver the presentation. Further details can be found at the library. Yes, um, young lady at the back. I noticed that there's no word limit given on the essay. Can you give us some more details about that? Actually, the limit is listed. It just happens to be on the next page. A technical problem with the printing. Now you'll be pleased to hear that we've reduced the word count on the essay from last year. Before it was 2,000, now it's 1,500. So that gives you some more time for your oral report, right? Can you give us any indication of the topics that will be available? Um, not at the moment. None at all? I'd like to make an early start on it if I can. I'll have them ready by the next lecture. I can say that they will all be to do with the unit studied, so if you consult your course readings, you will be able to get a general idea. Before you listen to the rest of the discussion, you have some time to have a look at questions 26 to 30.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 26 to 30. Now I'd like to give you an idea about the dates for these pieces of assessment. In late June the oral reports will be due. On the 21st of the following month the essay will be due. Mid-semester and end-of-semester exams will be given. I'm not sure of the exact dates for those, but they will be during the standard exam weeks in July and September. I'll have more information about the exact date during those weeks by next Tuesday. The oral reports can often take up quite a bit of time. Please make sure you stick to the time limit. Most of you should go no longer than 15 minutes. Any more than 20 and you'll be penalised, and no one wants that, do they? So, keep within the time limit, please. Excuse me, Dr. Thomas. I'm not very good with typing on the computer. Are we able to submit essays or reports which are handwritten? The short answer to that is no. My best advice to you is to make it a goal to learn to type. In this electronic age, it's a skill that all people must have, and I really believe it's in your best interest to learn. I believe there's a typing class held here at the university in the early evenings, Monday to Friday. If that doesn't suit, a computer-based typing program is good. The computer lab is open late on Monday, Tuesday and Thursday, I believe. I think you can even come in on weekends. Saturday nights and all day Sunday they're open. Failing that, I suppose you could pay someone, but it could become quite expensive. Now, I'd like to briefly discuss the exams for this semester. I'm a believer that if you are prepared to work hard, that means complete all homework tasks, be up to date with the readings and participate in lectures, you'll achieve your learning goals and pass this course. The exam questions are a combination of tasks assigned outside class time as well as, of course, the information we cover here in class. Well, I think that just about does it for the assessment overview. Are there any other questions? That is the end of Section 3. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers. Now turn to section 4 of your listening question booklet. Section 4 You will hear a lecture being given by a university professor to first-year students about the examination period. First, look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen to the lecture and answer questions 31 to 40. Welcome to our examinations workshop. This is an annual event which we have found very helpful for first-year students like yourselves and I hope that this year will be no exception. By now, you'll all have realized that studying at university is quite different to studying at school. Some of you might have been shocked at one time or another during the semester when you received results for your assignments that weren't as high as you'd expected. I trust that you've spoken to your lecturers and tutors and sorted out those issues. The truth is that the transition from school to university can be a difficult one. The academic standards are higher, and of course there is considerably less supervision at university and it's incumbent on the students to follow their own study regime. My aim today, though, is to help you to learn how to cope with the impending exam period by giving you some practical strategies to take with you into the exam. We've all known students who've had a good understanding of the subject material, yet failed exams or performed well below expectations. Likewise, we've known students that have, to all intents and purposes, done very little work and passed with flying colours. Often, 
These results can be put down to one thing, stress or a lack of it. Don't underestimate the importance that stress plays in exam performance. With any exam, you should front up feeling confident, relaxed, and organized. Rightly or wrongly, exams, in effect, not only test your academic ability, they test your frame of mind and your ability to perform under pressure. Stress has to be managed on two fronts, the physiological and the psychological. We all recognize that stress affects us physically. I'm sure you've all experienced an increased pulse or sweaty hands or underarms or shortness of breath when placed in a stressful situation. Sleeplessness can also be a problem around exam time. The most effective way to manage these physiological reactions is through controlled breathing, which we'll practice later. By controlling or regulating your breathing, you'll find that you can put yourself rather effectively into a relaxed state. Psychologically, stress affects the way you think. For an exam, you need to think rationally, and this is why you need to be confident and organized before walking into the exam. Continuing to think rationally after you read an exam paper which you know nothing about is very hard to do. But if you are organized and you've put in the time needed to learn the subject material, you will have the self-control you need to think rationally. Stress can make you panic, the worst thing you can do in an exam. Look at the question calmly and rationally dissect the question. And let's face it, even if you haven't prepared well enough, you'll still need to think rationally in order to do your best under those very trying circumstances. Just while I think of it, this is probably a good time to tell you a piece of advice that I give first-year students that come to see me. Don't rely on what other students tell you about the time they allocate to study. The reports we have had over the years have been ridiculously overestimated and underestimated. Follow your own study regime and don't listen to others. We're all different, so it stands to reason that the time we need to allocate to study will be different. Generally speaking, for every hour of lectures you attend, you will need another hour of follow-up or research work if you want to achieve good grades. Right, so where was I? We have to learn how to control our breathing and we need to have enough confidence in our ability to be able to think rationally. Time management is another important factor that can make or break you in an exam situation. After you have gone through the breathing exercises, which you'll be familiar with, read over the entire exam, noting the different marks and weighting of questions. Only after you have done this can you allocate your own time to each question. If I had a dollar for every time a student has told me that they didn't do as well in an exam as they'd hoped because they'd run out of time, I'd be rich. If you can manage your time properly in an exam, you will reduce the amount of pressure that you're under. Anyway, note the different questions and their marks and allocate your time accordingly, as I said. Then, answer the questions that you know first. This serves to relax you further and gives you the confidence you might need to tackle the more difficult questions. However, don't spend too much time on the easy questions either. Always be mindful of the time restraint and the marks that are assigned to the question. In summary, to do well in an exam, you not only need the academic ability, you need to be in a relaxed state of mind with the ability to think clearly enough under pressure to allocate suitable time frames to questions. If you can equip yourself with these skills and train yourself to observe time management, exam success is almost guaranteed. We'll be holding a study skills workshop next week in the Language and Learning Center to deal with ways in which you can study effectively for exams. You are all welcome, of course. Right, now... Are you ready to learn some controlled breathing exercises?
That is the end of section 4 and the end of the listening test. You now have...